Welcome to the Seaco School of Technology. We are so excited to, to have you all here and to have you learn a little bit about Seaco School of Technology. Before I get started with my remarks, I wanted to also introduce you to um, Chef Margaret Ferre, who leads up our culinary arts program. She's in the back there. Um, and her amazing students who have prepared the meal for you and who are, um, and they are here serving as well this morning. So thank you students, they did a really amazing job and they always do. Thank you, chef. Um, so for, I, I'm really excited that there's some folks here who have never been to the Seaco School of Technology, but um, so I will just tell you a little bit about who, um, who we are and what we do. Um, we are um, a career and technical um, school here in um, Exeter, New Hampshire. We serve six high schools. So in New Hampshire, career and technical education has regions. So we are region 18 um, and we serve um, Epping and Exeter and Newmarket, Raymond, Sanborn and Winniconnet. So those high schools come here for part of their day. So we are san uh, we're also a little different because we're a standalone career and technical student or um, uh, a career and technical high school. So many of them are embedded in high schools. So if you went over to um, Spalding High School in Rochester, they have their career and technical center right embedded in their high school. And we are standalone, so all of our kids get bussed in um, for 90 minutes a day. So we have our AM session here. These students are from different high schools um, from the area. Um, we offer 12 different programs. Um, we have um, you know, agriculture and welding and building construction. We also have a great pre-engineering program and marketing and computer science. We have a really cool digital media arts program for students who are interested in the arts but in that digital format. Um, we have an amazing biomedical science program um, and a careers and education program. Our culinary program is one of the best in the state um, and um, an automotive program, which is in a separate building. It's a huge facility um, that really looks like what you would see when you go into a car dealership and you look in their service station. That's what our, what, that's what our building looks like. So it's, we're really excited to have that kind of state of the art equipment and all of that it, it happens through, um, it, the, we're part of the public school system, which is also really great. So, um, so students come here, they don't have to pay. Um, it's all um, in tax dollars, so we love that. But we really, the most important part of what we do is that we connect with industry. And we have industry partners, and I see some of you um, in the room, we have industry partners who partner with our programs they um, serve on advisory boards, they work with our teachers, they work with our students, so that there are real, there's a real connection to industry. Um, we couldn't do it without our industry partners because we, we need to know um, that what we're doing is current, it's um, relevant, and that it's rigorous with our students so that we are really preparing them for industry. Um, after high school, whether they, you know, some of our students will go to the military, some of them will go to four-year school, some of them will go to the community college system, and some go straight to work. So we really want them to be pre prepared for any of those options. So that's how we organize our classes, is that's the kind of preparation that we're giving our students, and we celebrate all of those choices that students um, can make. Um, so that's really exciting for us. So we are always looking for new partnerships. So if you think that if that is something that your business would be interested in, you can contact me. Um, I'm gonna be giving some tours and some of our folks will be giving tours at the end of this event. So if you wanted to see some classrooms in action, I think that's a great way to see and learn more about, uh, about SST. Um, so thanks again, have a wonderful event. I'm excited to sit in and hear um, all of the speakers today. And I'll hand it over back to Jen, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Carr, and thank you again for hosting us today. And how about another round of applause for the culinary students and chef for this fantastic breakfast. I have to tell you, if you have not had the opportunity to uh, uh, sign up to get some of their 
um, pot pies or dessert pies or treats around the holidays, you definitely want to put that on your calendar because it's something you don't want to miss. Their turkey pot pie is one of the best I've ever had. So, um, of course, uh, I, want, I also want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we would not be able to put this program on without the help of our generous sponsors. So a couple thank yous for the people that uh, contributed to make this day possible. First, to our underwriter, Cambridge Trust. Uh, thank you. Uh, D.F. Richard, who sponsored our breakfast this morning. <clears throat> I also want to thank Exeter TV, who is standing in the back and is uh, filming today's program, and it will be available on the Exeter TV YouTube channel, so uh, make sure you check that out as well. So thank you to Exeter TV. I want to thank the uh, Chamber Ambassadors and the staff who made today possible. Bobby Vanderbilt, who's over there taking pictures, uh, our Member Services Director. <laughs> <laughs> and Renee Weiland, our events and program coordinator, standing in the back. <clears throat> so with that, uh, there's a lot to talk about this morning, and I'm, so I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to introduce Ryan Pope, who is going to introduce our speakers, and we're going to start this morning's discussion. So please join me in welcoming Ryan Pope, Cambridge Trust Vice President and Office Manager in Stratum. Good morning, friends and neighbors. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ryan Pope from Cambridge Trust up in Stratum. Uh, and once again, we have the privilege of uh, underwriting the Exeter Area Chamber of Commerce uh, economic forecast. Local banks like ours are charged uh, with supporting the vibrancy of the communities in which we serve. And I can think of few better ways to do that than to provide a shared opportunity for us to reflect on where we've been and more importantly, where we are going. So we are joined this morning uh, by Commissioner Taylor Caswell uh, and Brian Gottlob. Uh, Taylor Caswell is the first commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Business and Economic Affairs, first appointed to the position by Governor Chris Sununu in 2017. Commissioner Caswell serves as the chief economic and marketing official for the state and oversees the state divisions of economic development and travel and tourism development, enabling and growing economic vitality for residents and employers in the Granite State. In this role, Caswell has defined the narrative of New Hampshire as a place where people want to live and work and where companies can grow and thrive in the state's unique tax and opportunity climate. In collaboration with policymakers, stakeholders, and business leaders, he is working to update and modernize the state's broad infrastructure of community and economic stakeholders into a more strategic and meaningful network that will be critical to sustaining and growing New Hampshire's economy in the next century. And our second speaker today, is Brian Gottlob. Brian is the director of the New Hampshire Economic and Labor Market Information Bureau. Prior to accepting that position in late 2019, Brian was the principal of Polycon Research, an economic consulting firm located in Dover, New Hampshire. For more than three decades, Brian has analyzed economic, demographic, labor market, and industry trends for corporations, trade associations, government agencies, and legal lobbying firms. Brian has completed studies in a wide range of economic, demographic, and labor market issues in New Hampshire and 30 other states. Prior to founding Polycon, Brian was a vice president for fiscal and economic policy at the Business and Industry Association in New Hampshire. Uh, so I will turn the floor over to Commissioner Caswell first. Um, please hold your applause uh, until the end um, and uh, hold your questions until after both speakers have spoken. Um, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Caswell. No applause. No applause. <laughs> Do not clap. <laughs> I want to wait to hear what I have to say first. <laughs> thank you, uh, everybody. And thank you to the chamber for uh, having me back here. It's nice to be back in Exeter. Um, I don't remember which year it was I was here to talk a little bit about the economic forecast, and but I'm pretty certain that we were pretty much dead on with what we talked about at that point, uh, whatever that was. Um, I wanted today, because we've got Brian here, and Brian is um, always really interesting to listen to. He um, brings a, a lot, an interesting take on the data and what we're doing and what we're seeing on the state level, and he presents it in a really interesting way. 
uh, and we, you know, we, we do talk with some regularity uh, at the state level, and uh, Brian is a real resource for us at the state. Uh, so uh, hopefully you'll enjoy, uh, he'll have slides and stuff you can look at. Otherwise, with this one, you just got to stare at me. But um, I'm here because we, we really sort of, at the Department of Business and Economic Affairs, our role is to look at the big picture and to sort of talk about the different strategies and, this, and the trends and the things that we're seeing at the state level and find ways to make uh, are the system that we work with, the economic development organizations, the municipal organizations, the chambers and others, to try to define what the narrative is, uh, talk about how we're going to uh, collaboratively work toward uh, solutions for economic challenges and for the day-to-day -day functionality of what we do at the state level. Uh, which is, you know, everything from exports and international relations to uh, business recruitment, uh, workforce recruitment, um, you know, helping businesses access government contracting, workforce development, all those sorts of things. And, and, and try to make those pieces go together in a way that recognizes that at the state level we can't nor should we do it all, but we do have to um, um, accommodate for... Uh, what's really for a small state uh, a lot of different challenges in different parts of our of our state But if you go back now to uh, You know COVID and I was just talking with Jay a minute ago I mean you see these numbers that we're seeing and there's lots of of course, you know Interest behind these data, but we're going down 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 where this time you normally the last couple of years It's been quite the opposite And we go back to when we were really sort of getting into the heat of it, peak COVID, I keep calling it, in uh, 2020. Um, we were just starting to see it happening at this time uh, three years ago. <clears throat> and of course, everything that all of us went through, professionally, personally, and everything else during that period of time. And uh, some of the decisions that we had to be making at the state level at that point to um, try to chart a path in completely unknown waters. Um, we did things uh, that I was very involved with uh, and I think one of the highlights was something we called the reopening task force. I don't know if any of you remember any of that, but um, it was a task force made up of uh, a host of different policymakers, elected officials, business leaders, uh, trade association representatives. And we met literally every day starting in April uh, for several hours. Um, it was over the phone. It was before we discovered the magic of Zoom. Uh, these were conference calls that would last several hours. And what we would do is we would have representatives coming from different business uh, areas or uh, particularly, you know, places like retail or hairdressers, cosmetology, dentists, medical offices, those sorts of things, where there was normally a lot of interaction with individuals and with people. And, of course, we didn't know, you know, whether we got you know, like all turn into zombies at some point or how this was going to all work out. So we had to be very careful, but we were very, very deliberate about the fact that we needed to be able to find ways for people to continue to be able to make a living and continue to be able to do that if they so chose. And so the, 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 the result of all of these meetings was a very public forum where we had an opportunity to come together, talk about what the challenges were that we were seeing, have the Department of Health and Human Services on the call talking about what are, what, you know, what's the status today? What are we looking at today? What are the challenges? What are we seeing as, as really sort of the trends? And we tried to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis um, about you know, all the guidance documents that we had out. If you run a business, you know, you probably had to pour over all of those things for a couple of months and decide which you could, how you did this and how you did that. All based really in reality. And in, in some ways, you know, we ended up slightly different than a number of other states. And now as we're able to look back and see you know, and take a look and maybe uh, be a little uh, critical uh, view on what we did then. Um, a lot of what we did was we kept really critical industries open uh, and, and functional, where a lot of other states were just like, you know, just draw the line, we've got to close you down, and we're going to come back to this a little later. And when you look at things like manufacturing, which we never closed, we never told our manufacturers to close. We left that open, that decision to them. Um, you look at, uh, you know, obviously hospitality and restaurants still are suffering from the impacts of that. But that was, that's one of those industries where it's like everybody's sitting at a table. Everybody is uh, serving each other. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, personal contact in those situations. Uh, and we've 
you know, continue to try to support that industry as they come out of COVID things. But in the end, it set us up, I believe, because we were one of the first states to get back to our labor participation rates. We were one of the first states to see the level of economic activity come back in January of 2021. And if you look at things like tourism, we had a record year in the summer of 2021. We had places that had not seen tourism at you know this level for decades. All of a sudden, we're seeing huge increases. Cheshire County saw a 20% increase in tourism in 2021, summer of 2021. Um, you know that's a lot of people like to go over there, but it's usually a pretty you know pretty core group. But we saw a lot of people, and I think a lot of that was coming from Vermont and Massachusetts, where there was you know different rules. So anyway, I point that all out for a couple of things. And one is that um, it set uh, in motion one of the things that uh, you heard them read in my, my bio about having a collaborative culture, having a, 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 a system that recognizes that you can't just build bureaucratic walls around an economy and hope that you're going to be successful and sort of staying in that box. You've got to have capability to be flexible, but you've got to recognize that we have lots of different uh, concerns in different areas of the state. And how do you do that? You do that by building an infrastructure, an economic development infrastructure uh, that really supports a common vision of where the state should go. And the process that we went through at COVID, I think, demonstrated how that can be useful in a crisis situation. But it also set in motion and accelerated a lot of those, those components that we've been working on previous to that. And the results, I think, have started to really show themselves. I've been, I mean, just within our own staff and, uh, you know, with the, uh, in, in the organizations that we work with, these uh, collaborative economic development regions that we've set up, um, all of which have kind of set us on a path to continue to see, hopefully, continue to see success and resilience in our economy. Some of the methods that we've used to, to do that. We, said we, we invested in and developed an economic recovery and expansion strategy. All those points, you can find them on our website. I won't bore you with going through them all. Most of them will be obvious to people like you that spend your time in our economy. But um, we've made a number of investments in new tools and in new uh, uh, ways of looking at things. Taking what were common functionalities in the economic development world prior to COVID and then resetting them in the context of post-COVID. And what, what, you know, things like business recruitment. Business recruitment is very different now than it was before COVID. With the introduction of uh, remote working, the introduction of you know, not having to have site visits uh, every single time that you're, looking, you're trying to sell space, how you interact with other businesses and investors, the role of private equity continues to grow, and what's that, you know, how does that fit into uh, the types of businesses that we want to lease? And, and, and in fact, uh, the, the types of industries that we're seeing growing in different areas of the state are different, and the reasons why they're coming are different. And so we're taking a reset in that, in that category and in several other spaces as well. Um, complete relook at our state tourism strategy. Um, you know, it's been for decades the way that you, get, you gauge whether you're successful in a uh, strategy is whether your room and meals tax went up, how many people came, and how much money they spent. That's great, but that's not really speaking to the fact that in a lot of areas of the state right now, you've got people parking up and down highways to get up on trailheads. You've got, uh, you know, really sensitive environmental areas in the White Mountains that are just being, you know, run over by just hordes of people. Uh, and a, there's, there's a lot of education about other places you can hike. If you're from Boston, the only place to hike is not Franconia Notch. There are plenty of other places you can go. Uh, those sorts of things. And how do you do that in a state that depends so heavily on the spend rates that we have for tourism? And how many, and, and, and maintain that. I have interesting conversation yesterday about um, reservations. And you know, state parks are now requiring reservations for most of their locations. And what does that do to local, what's the local economic impact if all of a sudden you're limiting people that are coming uh, and what time they come and so on and so forth. And it's interesting because most of the data does show that when you, uh, when you do that sort of thing, you actually see the local economic impact come up because instead of standing in line and waiting for things or waiting in their car and not being able to go buy other things, there's, an, there's a, uh, an interesting dynamic that comes from them being relaxed. They know they don't have to rush to their parking spot. Maybe they'll stop and you know, have lunch somewhere or that sort of thing. Um, 
So we're really taking, you know, these are all things that we didn't think that much about. I mean, we knew they were there. Parks says that they used to use the eye test where they'd send out somebody and look at the parking lot. That's full. <laughs> that was their measure. Now we're being uh, a little bit more scientific about it. Um, I think as far as uh, the challenges go, obviously, you know, a lot of the same ones continue to exist. Workforce, right? Workforce. We still have uh, challenges in that space, even as we see, you know, big tech right nationally starting to scale a little bit of that back. Um, that impacts us a little bit, not huge. Um, but uh, we're continuing to see um, challenges in those spaces. And, and, and two areas that we're making some uh, pretty significant uh, investment in as part of that is in workforce housing and in broadband development. Now, I know, you know high, access to high-speed internet in a lot of our southern tier uh, communities is not as huge of a challenge. I know it is in spots. But you get up into the North Country or the western part of the state or the Upper Valley area, and there's still some significant gaps. Uh, and uh, how are we going to be able to address that? We've been trying for decades. And, and, and I won't get into all of that because I know all of you agree with that. But the problem is that when you look at New Hampshire traditionally versus other states like Mississippi or uh, Alabama, particularly in the south, where just a few years ago they still only, you know, they had 20% of their population still didn't even have access to the Internet. Any federal funds that we were being able to utilize to expand our own network were extremely limited. We weren't able to really compete because on paper, New Hampshire looked really good. Most of our population had access. That's a different measure, of course, whether you have access or whether it's actually there or you can get it. Um, the, uh, so this was an opportunity where under the uh, federal um, COVID recovery funds, you know, we've got a significant amount of money that we're able to put towards this and it just sort of lock that down. And that, so that's really important for small rural communities in a world where you've got a lot of people that are working remotely and a lot of people are looking for the quality of life that you can get in rural communities, particularly in New Hampshire, and they want to come and they want to live there and they want to buy a house and they want to start participating in their community and they want to start, you know, eating at the restaurant downtown and that brings a lot of resources, it brings kids to the community, which for me is a good thing. I know a lot of people think that might not always be the case in terms of property tax costs and the rest of it, but having kids and the, the younger generations growing up here and experiencing that and like me, you know, going away and coming back, it's not a bad strategy over a long term. So the broadband piece, uh, we've invested uh, $100 million in workforce housing development under a program called InvestNH. Uh, we've already deployed you know, in excess of $60 million worth of that. And, and it was a hugely competitive program where we had enough money to do $50 million worth of investments in multifamily workforce, 80% or below AMI uh, units that were in development. Not you know just sort of like hey I have this field I want to build some housing in it. It had to be projects that were along the way. They're being impacted by inflation or workforce costs or delays that tends to happen in this real estate world. Uh, we wanted to be able to accelerate those, get those online as quickly as we possibly could. So this is going to result in a thousand new units of affordable housing in all areas of the state, uh, and it will do that within 18 months. Uh, the thing is, is that that program was a competitive program for-profit, non-profit, um, you know, really, really small properties to really, really big properties. And uh, we had, uh, under that program, $50 million to deploy. Uh, we had 150 million, 100, did I say million? Sorry, I've been doing this too long with the millions and billions. Million, uh, $50 million uh, to deploy, uh, $150 million worth of applications. So almost all of them were eligible. So, very competitive, but what that tells you is that there are a lot of other units that are kind of close to being becoming online, and that's an important component because we can't continue to grow the economy if we don't have the workforce to meet the needs of all of our employers, and we can't meet the needs of the workforce and the employees if they don't have anywhere to live. Right? Follow? <laughs> So that's that's really, and I say this all the time. I think I think obviously workforce, but the 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 housing challenge is the biggest one for us. The last thing I'll say about that, because I'm probably going on too long, but the last thing I'll say about that is that the other piece of workforce housing, it's not all about the money. We could have a trillion dollars to put into 
uh, workforce housing development for the developers. But if we have communities that are not willing to uh, to uh, permit those locations or to recognize the value of having more individuals in your community to help feed your economy and help participate in your in your in your community, uh, then that's kind of useless, right? So almost half of the funds that we've got for this program are designed to go to communities. And for those of you who have had any interaction over the last 10 or 15 years in trying to promote the idea of affordable workforce housing in whether it's the legislature or in local communities, there have been a lot of brick walls, right? And so it's been very difficult at the state level. We've tried three or four times now to get some uh, key legislation passed, and it hasn't yet. And I think part of the reason is because you've got a lot of communities that are very stalwart. They're like, I don't want this. They, you know, and, and, and okay, fine. You don't have to have it, right? But what I want to do and what we've started to do with this program is to go to uh, what I call the communities of the willing. So we have communities that are willing to do this. Why do they have to not uh, be able to receive some benefit uh, and some recognition to, to advance this initiative that is so central to our economy? Uh, if, the, if just because you've got some that don't, right? So all of these programs that we've built for the municipal programs are voluntary, and they're for pro communities that want to look at their planning and zoning rules. They want to look at how they can improve those, update them, or even establish them in some cases, right? Or uh, you know, we've got a $10,000 per unit grant program for communities that, that will permit affordable housing in their communities. They then can turn around and apply for this grant of $10,000 per unit, and they can use it however they want. Well, not however they want. But, you know, it's extremely flexible resource. Some of them are using it maybe to put a street light out front because people always have traffic concerns, right? Or maybe they're putting it back into that property itself. Maybe they're saying, we want to put that in there and maybe help with the rents or whatever. So there's a lot of flexibility with that. And that's been, uh, that's been hugely successful. There's still a uh, resource available for any of you municipal officials who are here. Uh, we want to make sure that that program is fully utilized. And then there's discussion in the legislature this year to revitalize that with some state money. Imagine, we're going to have some state money that might be able to go into a housing development. That will be a, a real win, I think, for a lot of us. So in any case, I'll just wrap up. Those are some of the key issues. I mean, there's obviously a lot going on. And, um, uh, but I, I really do believe that central to all of it, housing, broadband, workforce, education, all these things, uh, central to all of it and central to our success as a state is the collaboration that we built and that we continue to build. It's really critical because you, you, we all know, you know, over time it ebbs and flows. It depends kind of like who's sitting in what seats. But if you don't have people who are willing to work together regionally or in, on a state level and not always be worrying about, you know, who's, who's getting what and who's not kind of thing, um, we really need to uh, establish that. And it makes it, uh, gives us a competitive advantage because other states aren't doing that. The states that we compete with, businesses that come here say, wow, it's awesome that you guys, I can make a phone call to somebody like Mikhail, who's on our staff here today for BA, and say, you know, I've got this problem. And all of a sudden, you know, we're able to access commissioners or we're able to access state level uh, leadership to be able to fix that problem, or at least try to fix it in some cases. Uh, that's something you just can't get in other states. And it sounds corny and it sounds sort of small, like, oh, it's, the, you know, just, um, personal relationship types up, but it makes a difference and it's a competitive advantage that we have, we've always had, but we have it really, really strong right now. So um, for me, that's, that's the business of economic and community development, it's relationship building. But in any case, I will stop there. I'm happy to talk about any questions. Make sure you don't clap for me. And Brian, uh, Brian is gonna, I think, come up after me if that's correct, all right? Thank you. You can clap for me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I gotta get this up. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Brian. I'm just gonna get your sure, PowerPoint please. up, but I'll let you. Yeah, um, I'll grab this. Please do. Because I cannot stand behind a mic, uh, a podium. Of course, I, I, just not strong enough. <laughs> uh, a, a couple of uh, just 
caveats. One, um, if don't bother taking notes. I don't see a lot of pencils out there. Um, anybody who wants a copy of the presentation, um, Jennifer has that, um, Chamber has that, and you can have it. Um, I've got way too many slides, so I will rush through some of them, maybe not talk too much about them. Um, other caveats, uh, it's really a very difficult time to be in the forecasting business, and anybody who does it should be very humble. Uh, I will tell you, you didn't get that guy here today. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to cover a number of things. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what I see happening um, trend-wise in New Hampshire. Uh, very little about what I think is happening regionally in New Hampshire because I don't really have a lot of time to dig into what I see happening here in this region. But I do have some um, reasonably positive news. And then I'm going to focus more of the time on what I see happening nationally because that's really um, the issue uh, that we're looking to address. How likely is it that we're going to have a recession? My view. Um, and I will say it's not uh, the conventional view or certainly not the majority view, is I do think we can avoid a recession. Um, I think uh, 2022 is not, 2023 is not going to be a great year. It may be difficult to distinguish between what's an official recession and what's just a slow economy. Um, but I think there's a real and increasingly strong possibility that we avoid recession. So with that long introduction, let's talk about um, what's happening in terms of how people feel about the economy. Um, one, it is just unbelievable from my perspective how pessimistic um, people are, um, unrealistically so. Economists love to point out negatives and look for the next bad thing, and the media loves to report about bad things. Um, I just read an article that said, um, the stories in the media about negative economic events and they, they, over the last year, and they compared it to prior recessions way, way above what um, was uh, talked about in previous recessions. So I think there's an unrealistic pessimism, and that's a little bit reflected, certainly in these two measures. The blue line is the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index done on a monthly basis. Um, and you see it's pretty low right now. It goes through December. Um, but it's lower than it was during the worst part of the pandemic, which to me is pretty astounding. The good news about this is, is that even though consumers are saying they're not very, pe they're, they're quite pessimistic, they have cut back their spending, but they haven't cut back um, totally. They haven't dramatically cut back their spending. Um, and businesses, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, Small Business Optimism Index, a little bit more realistic, but still showing um, a decline and, and um, less optimism. Um, I follow that one pretty closely because it tends to track what's happening to private sector job growth in New Hampshire, even though it's not New Hampshire specific, but it does do a pretty good job of tracking. So um, my concern, and it's been probably for the last six months or almost a year, is that we can talk ourselves into a recession, certainly since um, uh, February or March when the Russian invasion took place and prices skyrocketed. Um, and that's when sentiment really began to, to turn down. Prices rose. Um, a lot of not good things happened. So I'm on a mission to not be Pollyannish, but to present kind of an alternative view that um, we can avoid a recession. We don't have, a, in New Hampshire, a measure of uh, consumer sentiment that's done on a regular basis. I like high-frequency measures and I like them specific to New Hampshire. One of the things that I did, started doing during the pandemic, when government data was too slow to come out, we didn't have enough of it um, and enough with enough frequencies, I started looking at Google Trends and searches, search intensity on the word recession. And I, when I look back on that, it tracks pretty well what's happening in terms of the economy. When people are very concerned about a recession, they start searching on the word recession in uh, Google. In the pandemic, that's that shaded area. Um, searches went up, leveled off as the pandemic eased, and it jumped up. When? It jumped up at the Russian invasion. Oil prices spiked. All prices spiked. And a lot of bad things happened. People got very nervous about a recession. It's eased, but it's bounced around. It's still elevated. The other thing about this chart, New Hampshire's the red line, US is the blue line, or black line. I can't really tell. Um, New Hampshire has generally been a little bit more optimistic. And I think that's reasonable, because I think our economy has overall performed better than, than a majority of, of states. 
Um, and this is one indication of that. This is um, how close or how far each state is from regaining all of the private sector jobs it lost during the pandemic. So as you see, this is through December. Um, New Hampshire has 1% more jobs in the private sector than it had prior to the pandemic. Only Maine has done a little bit, little bit better. Um, almost all the New England states are significantly further behind in recovering there. And this is really important, I think, because um, when you look at the states that are well above their pre-pandemic, those are states that didn't have the, the shutdowns, didn't have, you know, didn't do the, the pandemic um, efforts, engage in, in the efforts to control the pandemic the way the Northeast did. So compared to our Northeast neighbors, we did very well. Now, just focusing, pat yourselves on the back, folks. This is a little different metric. It's from a different um, data source. It's from administrative records. Um, each employer has to file um, for uh, reports on how many people they have and the wages that they pay to the unemployment insurance uh, trust fund. Um, this is based on that data. And I, the most recent data we have is from the second quarter. It, the uh, third quarter data will come out in probably a few weeks. Um, but it just shows over the last year, taking a look at some of the communities in New Hampshire that have um, you know, at least seven to 10,000 employees working in the community, at jobs in the community, how Exeter compares. And you see, compares very, very well. Highest job growth of any of the communities. So doing very well there. There is some, there are some concerns. Job growth is slowing. Job growth is slowing nationally. It's slowing in New Hampshire a little bit more. I do not believe it's because we have a weaker economy. It's because we are more labor constrained than the nation as a whole. In 2021, New Hampshire had significantly faster job growth than did the nation overall, um, particularly in the private sector. Um, but we have really run up against um, labor constraints. And you employers out there, I, I haven't talked to an employer who hasn't struggled over the last year in, term, in, in uh, getting employees. And thanks to the Career Technical Center, <laughs> the Seacoast, um, helping to alleviate that, uh, that, that uh, backlog. So we're on, this is good news and bad news. It's good news in that the Federal Reserve wants to see this happen. The Federal Reserve is very concerned about a tight labor market and what that does for wages and drives up weight, weight and creates potentially a wage price spiral. So the Federal Reserve would love to see zero job growth. Doesn't want to see negative job growth, but it would love to see neg zero job growth. And it's going to do whatever it can to get us close to that. And it raised interest rates yesterday. Uh, 25 basis points. It'll raise again at least a couple of more times this year, probably 20, another 50 basis points in total. So good news and bad news. Um, here's some not great news for the region. Now, um, this looks at, it's a different data source. This is based on monthly surveys of employers. So I'm a little bit skeptical on a monthly basis of these data, particularly um, in the, during the pandemic and post-pandemic survey responses haven't been great, but this is the monthly data that you maybe see on a, on a regular basis. It's based on a relatively small survey of employers, um, and from that we estimate what has happened uh, to uh, job growth. I look at the the three major regions, employment regions in the state. And I, at the Seacoast, by the way, includes the Portsmouth labor market area and the Dover-Durham labor market area. Um, I could separate them out, but I really, to me, that, that distinction is really artificial. It is really one labor market from my perspective. So as you see, it's declined um, a slowing rate year over year in all of the regions with the exception of the Manchester region. So the Manchester region has um, been increasing uh, job, um, its job growth. So a declining slower uh, rate. I think the rate, the, the region, the region is 
more affected by labor constraints than any other region. And, and it's, we're really a victim of our successes. And I say we, because I live in Dover, um, we're really a victim of our successes. We have the highest um, housing costs. Rockingham, by far, has the highest housing costs. Stratford County, the Dover, Durham labor market is about the New Hampshire average, but the southern part of it is not. So the Dover, Durham area is much higher than the, the so I think, you know, we're, we're, we've kind of priced ourselves out in, in terms of the, the, the labor force. But, okay, so we've got slower job growth, but the thing is we don't have fewer job openings. This is um, a measure, it's an index number, so it basically starts 100 January or March of 2019 and compares the number of job postings during that time period to the time periods that follow. And what you see is we've got twice, more than twice as many job openings as we had prior to the pandemic. So there is labor demand. There is strong labor demand. Seacoast, or Ports, I actually broke it out in this case, the Portsmouth labor market area. So the Portsmouth labor market area actually has a bit more compared to pre-pandemic levels than, it ha than does New Hampshire overall. So that line that you saw below average for job growth is not reflected in the number or the opportunities in the region. So the key issue is really labor and labor constraints. And the commissioner talked about housing, which is a big part of it, and I think a big part of this region's, um, why this region in its labor, uh, labor force has struggled as much as it has or, uh, of, of late. Um, just, this is a metric uh, looking at um, unfilled job openings, and I look at New Hampshire and the US. Basically, it compares two measures. The job openings rate, which is just businesses reporting how many they jo jobs they have as a percentage of the number of overall jobs in the economy. So, um, and the job hiring rate, how able are those businesses to hire? How many people are they hiring as a percentage of overall employment? So the difference, the delta is the job openings rate, the unfilled job openings rate. And what you see is New Hampshire's unfilled job openings rate is higher than the nation overall. Again, it's a measure of how constrained we are, our labor force is constrained. Our economy is as strong, when I look at the, the, the distribution uh, of our industries, the mix of industries, we're really in a great spot. What we aren't in a great spot is in terms of our labor force and our ability to, to f fill those positions. Um, when I look at, uh, just I, I looked at the region, and I looked at job openings in the region, broke it down by uh, the companies in your region, Portsmouth labor market area, that had the most job openings. You see who's at the top, it's healthcare fields. Healthcare fields, um, are in critical, you know, critically uh, under, you know, undersupplied with labor, um, really significantly. But you see a lot of other companies, and it's a broad mix. So there's openings everywhere. Um, all of the red are, are healthcare organizations. When we look again at the issue that I believe is the most significant issue that, and challenge that New Hampshire faces, it is the labor force. This is a, another index number, so it compares the nation, black line, or um, New Hampshire, always the red line, and just for the heck of it, I looked at Massachusetts, and it compares where we are now to where our peak labor force was prior to the pandemic. New Hampshire's labor force was at its largest in November of 2019. So compared to that peak, we are about 1% below where we were in 2019. There's, and to put that into numbers, that's about 8,000 less, fewer people in the labor force than we had in, at the end of 2019. Those are people who were probably working, certainly were looking for work if they weren't. Um, and that does not include the growth in our population. 
So we would expect to be well above that, three years of population growth, and we're still 1% below where we were. We would have normally had labor force growth um, without the pandemic. Now we're not even back to where we were, even with that population growth. So that's the real constraint. Again, looking at the different regions, uh, combining the seacoast, because that's one, from my perspective, that's one labor market. You see who's lagging the field. The seacoast region. Seacoast region, again, most higher percentage or higher growth in job postings, but the labor force is lower than it was, significantly lower than it was prior to the pandemic, and it has been recovering more slowly. Again, I think that's a, we're a victim of our success. You know, I used to, I've done a number of these presentations. I always do the Dover economic forecast. And for a decade, I could go in there and say, look, the Seacoast was the standout region. It was. It was the standout region. But you know what? There's regions now that have kind of caught on to some of the more positive things we've done. You know, for a long time, Manchester, from my perspective, lagged. They're starting to do the right things. They're starting to do, they're starting to do the kinds of things at the Seacoast. You know, quality, rental housing in the downtown area, makes it attractive places for people to live, young people. We did that for a long time, but you know, we're just now constrained. We've, we, uh, the prices are higher, um, the opportunities are, are, are fewer for people to live here, to move here. So that's the challenge for the seacoast. And it's allowing other regions to, to catch up. I don't wanna go too deeply, but um, this is just a measure of um, the difference in labor force participation among age groups in New Hampshire compared to pre-pandemic levels. And what you see is that young people have stepped out of the labor force more. Originally, I thought, well, you know, young people got $4,000 in stimulus money. A lot of young people work in industries that had big layoffs during the pandemic. They got $600 from the federal government plus unemployment benefits from New Hampshire, 72% of the people, from my calculations, who got unemployment insurance during the, that $600 time period when the Fed was giving 600, federal, federal government was giving $600 in additional unemployment, but 72% of the people in New Hampshire were making more un, unemployed than they were making employed. So I said, oh, that can't last. People are gonna come back, um, but they haven't. But here's the thing. I think this greatly overstates the number of people who haven't, who, ha who haven't returned to the labor market. I think they're just doing different things. They're doing more gig work. They, this is astounding to me. People make money, can make money, young people mostly, playing video games online. We have things called influencers. I don't know what an influencer is. <laughs> I certainly am not an influencer. But they make money. So I think what's happening, here's my theory, is I think this is based on a survey that the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Department does on a monthly basis. They call up households and they say, oh, give me the third oldest person in the household, or sec second oldest person. And they ask them, you know, are you currently working? Are you looking for a job? You know, and, and all that. And I think if, they're, if you're 25 years old and you're an influencer, you're getting paid to play video games online and somebody from the government calls you and you're not getting a W-2, you may be a little bit, because a little bit reluctant to say, yeah, I'm working. Because the next call may come from somebody saying, have you reported that income? So I think the question needs to be when Bureau, and I've said this to them, Bureau of Labor Statistics, is somebody compensating you to do something? That's, it's a different, you know, it, it I think younger people have a different view of whether they're employed or not. So I think that overstates it. The other, at the other end, old, older residents, or older um, individuals stepped out of the labor force in big numbers early on. They're starting to come back. They had health issues um, early on, more concerns about the effects of the pandemic. So they, they stepped out, they're starting to come back. Here's the grand finale, not quite the finale. But here's my thesis of uh, my outlook and what I think is likely to happen. And uh, it's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. 
So it's possible we can avoid a recession. It is still very uncomfortably high that, that a, a recession could occur. So I do not fault anybody who says 2023, we're going to fall into a recession. I just think they're wrong. Um, and if I'm wrong, I won't be back. So <laughs> you, you, you may know where, how to find me. Um, so I think household finances are clearly better positioned to withstand current price shocks um, with inflation. Now, I, the caveat there is not all households. Clearly, lower income households are struggling. Middle, upper income households better able to handle current situation. Inflation clearly is moderating and rent increases are slowing, which won't show up in the BLS CPI data. Um, you know, rental contracts are just on a, you know, uh, once a year. It takes them a long time to get into the uh, CPI mix. Shelter, shelter represents 32 percent of the CPI. Just in case you didn't know that. So inflation, if you just look at the last three months and annualize what's happened in the last three months, inflation is running about three and a half percent. Businesses, this is the key, absolute key. I think businesses are going to be loath to lay off workers. They have struggled over the last couple of years to, uh, you know, to hire people. So I think even in a soft economy, they're going to be very reluctant to let people go because they may not be able to get people back. And in a situation where people are not being laid off, uh, on big numbers, that means income isn't going to drop, which means consumption may, will slow, but it's not going to drop, and that becomes very hard to have a recession if you don't have big numbers of people being laid off and big losses of income. Um, household financial debt, relatively low by historical standards. You know, we talk about interest rates, but 80% of the debt held by households is fixed rate. So, you know, who didn't refinance their home if they had a mortgage over the last, you know, few years? So I think the effects of inflation will be a little bit less significant. Um, corporate debt's low, banks are well capitalized, consumer spending slowing, uh, and it will continue to slow, but it's still positive at the moment anyway, year over year. And again, without consumers cutting spending dramatically, without big layoffs, it's hard to see a recession. The one caveat, debt ceiling could blow it all up. You know, I say this all the time. I hate the debt ceiling fights. Dumbest idea that ever came out of Washington, and that is saying a lot. <laughs> so just to put um, emphasis on it, uh, Wall Street Journal sur uh, surveys 70, 70 economists on a regular basis, not all, not every month or anything. Um, the mean percent, uh, mean probability that they assigned to a recession in 2023 is 61%, dropped a little bit. Um, so clearly I am in the minority. Um, I will say the highlight, one of the highlights of my career, twice I've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal. Highlight of my career, long time ago though. I, apparently I, they did not like what I had to say. Um, household financial obligations ratio. I show this very nerdy. But these shaded areas are prior recessions. Household financial obligations, what are they? They're things that households have to pay, mortgages, rent, um, and uh, insurance, things like that. So we begin a year that will be difficult, no doubt, but in a much, much better position than any of the prior recessions. So that's why I say I think we can withstand a downturn. And again, without large-scale layoffs, um, it, it's hard for me to see uh, a recession. Inflation coming down, uh, U.S. CPI in blue, Northeast coming down, so really positive trends there. Um, retail sales still positive. Um, this is two measures. One, total retail sales year over year on a three-month moving average basis it tends to move, bounce up and down. Here a lot of negative things about November and December, December retail sales. Um, I think that's mostly a timing issue. You know, people used to, you know, used to be Black Friday, now it's Black Halloween. People just, I think, shifted a lot of the spending to earlier time periods. Um, automobile sales, problematic, low inventories, and that's really hurting overall retail sales. Love high, high frequency metrics that I can look at what's happening in New Hampshire. This is a measure um, of seeded Restaurant reservations. I love high frequency. This is done on a daily basis. It's through 
think this data, I took it through January 20th. So when people are feeling really negative, one of the first things they cut is dining out. So I know I'm, I'm almost done. Get in the, get in the, get in the hook. Um, anyway, so this compares New Hampshire to U.S., Massachusetts, and what you see is people have not really cut back in New Hampshire yet. So that's really positive, um, significantly higher in terms of it's restaurant reservations, but also walk-ins. So it's seated, it's, it's butts in seats, as they say. So doing well there, last two charts. Um, so my outlook, I think, um, you know, again, it's gonna be hard to distinguish between slow growth and a recession. I see, you know, 2022 will end up somewhere around 2% GDP growth, I'm saying 2023, a little over 1%, but not a recession. I think uh, unemployment will be somewhere around 4, rise somewhere around 4 in 2023. When I look at job growth in New Hampshire, 2022 will end up somewhere between 2.5, I think, and, and, and 2.8. Um, and in 2023, we'll see a significant slowdown, but not negative job growth, and New Hampshire will be slower than the, than the U.S. again not because we have a weaker economy, but because our labor force is not recovering as fast. That's our challenge, that's my organization's challenge, that's Taylor's organization, and there's multifaceted aspects to that. It's housing, it's a whole host of things. With that, I will stop and drop the mic. <laughs> I need your strength, Jennifer. I think you were just on an angle, of a strange angle. But, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Brian. Um, actually, come on back because I'm going to invite uh, the commissioner to come back. And, um, and I know that there are uh, lots of questions, lots to think about. So uh, let's open it up to the floor and see what kind of questions you have. Renee is going to be walking around with the mic. If you could use that so that we can all hear you, that would be wonderful. And um, with that, take it away. I'm gonna be honest, I only heard about that like this week. So, sounds nice. <laughs> I, sorry, sorry. Sure. Good morning, Corey Stevens. Uh, thanks for being with us today and, and providing your slides here. Um, any sense as far as folks not getting back into the labor market in New Hampshire, whether it's folks just sitting on the sidelines or people leaving the state? Not people leaving the state. I have a whole presentation that didn't make it into <laughs> these slides. I, I always have t twice as many slides that show up. Um, what we've seen is an uptick in net mig migration from other states. It's been stronger. One, pandemic played a role in that. Um, Northeast has a lot of metro areas. People were looking for less density, um, cheaper housing, quality of life. So we saw an increase. Importantly, what I think even as important or more importantly, we're starting to see a younger demographic. Um, we're seeing a big increase in that 25 to 29. I have a chart that I cut at the last minute and I feel bad about it now. New Hampshire between 2015 and 2021 had the fifth highest percentage increase in 25 to 29 year olds of any state. And if I go back to 2014, it was the second highest. So originally that was focused in the Seacoast region. Now it's spreading out because communities are starting to understand. Manchester's starting to understand. You've got to have the quality rental housing in the downtown to attract younger folks. So we're in greater competition, but it's not because people, it's a mystery. I'll tell you, it is a mystery, but it's not because the, the population and migration, people leaving, just the opposite. We, you know, we are attracting people, but, and the, that's great for our demographics. May not be great for all of you who are hiring because a lot of those people are working elsewhere. Remote work has created all that kind of opportunity and companies are robbing our talent. We've got a very talented labor force and companies from all over the nation are looking to hire and when you can work remotely, um, we're in competition and salaries tend to be higher in a lot of places so 
we're dealing with that. Like that? Okay. Hi, uh, Jay Charles. I just have a question about the the work that we're, we're do, you're doing with Invest New Hampshire and investing in housing. Um, from a lot of what I've seen, every time that there is a um, a move forward in in building workforce housing, say in Portsmouth, where they recently finished the Ruth Griffin Center, um, 64 units, but 250 on the waiting list, that other surrounding communities tend to look at even what Exeter is doing. Exeter is doing some things with workforce housing. And the surrounding communities often are like, whew, dodged a bullet because the, the, what they call the urban centers the, the, are, are, are building some of the, the rental units. However, is there a way that that incentivizing, um, you know, there's the hammer, uh, the stick, and the and the carrot around these surrounding communities that so far have pretty successfully said, we don't want it, it should be the next town over. So it's not even necessarily the rural areas, that's a whole other thing. But these areas around the areas that, we, that you mentioned um, that are rebuffing housing really, in some ways, need to get a mitt and get in the game and have so far a lot of them been able to dodge that. No, I think that's true. I don't think that's <clears throat> a unique uh, scenario to New Hampshire. I think that you probably see that everywhere. There, we're not going to be in the business of forcing communities to build, right? So um, as long as th that remains the case, there's limited opportunities. I think, as I was saying before, the whole concept of the communities of the willing, right? And sort of, I will say that when we started with this type of approach of working with communities that want to have the housing, the number of communities that fall into that category has grown, right? Because they're sort of like, oh, see, that wasn't so bad. They did okay with that. So there's a little bit of that. The only sort of functional component we would have within the funding was that we do have a cap of a uh, million dollars per community that they could take. So for the incentive program. So that doesn't, that makes sure it doesn't all sort of show up in Manchester or Portsmouth or Nashville, that kind of thing. So um, other communities probably won't come anywhere near that cap, right? But um, that's the only sort of functional piece within there that we've done. But it, in the end, it's really sort of a little bit of what I was talking about earlier about how we have to actually take a little bit of a long view, and I know it's been a long, long, long view, is uh, all the things that Brian's talking about, all the needs that the state has. Uh, but I think you look at the dynamics, the net migration numbers, the younger people you know, sort of showing up uh, is a reflection of where that is starting to be a little bit more impactful than before it was just, just in the Seacoast, really just sort of just in Portsmouth. Taylor, on his question about getting these loans, you see, you put a limit on it, and the towns know there's a limit. So last year, I went to the planning board in Epping about workforce housing, and there was close to 75 people there. And it was shocking on how the planning board members perceived the development of this construction. And so the town required them to put play space. So since there's going to be 20 units, there has to be a playground for the children. I grew up in the city. My playground was the pavement. So the, the towns are implementing things into the planning to cause the cost to exceed the $1 million. Mm -hmm. There were five guys, one woman. The one woman actually had the gall to say this over the microphone. It's a sad day in Epping history that we're going to have to allow an apartment. And this is the sentiment. The government does not watch what they do. So three years ago, 
you force the state to allow secondary houses on your property for in-laws. The following year, the town implemented the fence line. Does everyone know what the fence line is? All right, so your property line. It used to be 25 feet, so you cannot build a structure within 25 feet of your property line of your neighbor, and so on. They increased it to 50. So think about your property and a 50-foot border all the way around. So every time the state does something, the communities come back with another action to hurt the workforce housing. Well, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the state, any sort of state zoning rules that are forced down onto local communities. I think in most cases, those are um, decisions that are made on local levels. And it speaks to what I was saying earlier, which is there are a lot of uh, challenges to building housing of any type in New Hampshire. Uh, a lot of times those are inflicted by local planning and zoning rules. Uh, a lot of communities, and we're helping to facilitate this by overcoming the cost of uh, a relook or, a, or, a, or a, an improvement in your zoning rules with grant programs to hope, hopefully allow them to take a look what, at what is causing some of these concerns and some of these added costs. Uh, but that is ultimately, in New Hampshire, a local decision. Uh, my question is not related to housing, which I think we should continue to discuss. Um, I would like to know more hard data on what's happening with the younger segment of the workforce. Um, with all due respect, I don't think many people are relying on being social influencers. Um, I do think gig work is significant, um, but a lot of the more high compensating gig work is actually report, reported and reportable. Um, so I think we're missing some critical information on, on these workers. Well, one, I, I wasn't suggesting that they're all influencers. It was, a, it was an example. I, my point is there are different ways to, to, uh, to be compensated, and some of those, I believe, are not being picked up in the traditional methods of, of, uh, of counting the labor force. Um, you know, it's not like we aren't adding young people. Um, again, I cited that data. There is, there's a myriad of reasons why some of those folks are not in the labor force. Um, you know, if you get to the upper end of that range, there are child care issues that have hurt. I, you know, I, I break out some of that participation by gender, and you see child care has had a, great, a greater impact. Um, you know, we're down 600 child care workers from pre-pandemic levels, that means spaces are gonna be more limited. So there's that issue. There's a whole host of reasons. Um, the point is, from my perspective, is that um, it's not like we don't have people. What we don't have is people who maybe you have access to or businesses have access to. So there is slack out there. Um, it's, you, you know, I look at the difference between a W-2 earner are mostly the people that you all hire and the, the gig workers. And there's a real battle among younger folks um, for that labor force. One of the tests I think we'll get over the next year is as the economy weakens, how much of that gig work is gonna be out there? Is there gonna be a decline? And if there is, we may start seeing more of those folks, um, you know, moving to W-2 employment. Um, and another thing, as you get older and you start having responsibilities, like a family, like a mortgage, maybe that, you know, that gig work doesn't look as secure and you start thinking about a whole lot of different things. So um, I think that will be tested over the next year, next couple of years, how long that, I fully expect that that younger demographic is going to come back to the more traditional way of earning a living, and that means more W-2. Still, we're going to see elevated levels of gig work. The gig economy is real, but I think it's been really exacerbated um, over the last couple of years. Okay, thank you. And this is the last question. Oh, no pressure. <laughs> Make it good. 
Oh, all right, which one? No, uh, hi, I'm Kimberly. I manage the YMCA in town, Camp Lincoln. So nice segue to my question. We, a big part of what we do is not only healthy living, but uh, youth development. So we really are the workforce behind the workforce. So wondering, uh, one, like out of Taylor's office, I know you've worked a lot in housing and, and could you talk a little bit about what your office is doing for that? And then secondly, not in a political fashion, but our minimum wage, I, I could never offer anyone our, our minimum wage. So what's the messaging, what's the, the economics connected to that? Well, I wish I could go on forever out of those two. Uh, housing, I mean, I, for what we're doing at, at the Department of Business and Economic Affairs, I pretty much laid a lot of that out. It's the municipal component uh, that's roughly, it's dollar figures and it's um, programs for uh, the municipal per unit that I mentioned. There's a program for demolition. Uh, to help um, free up some space for development, uh, and there's a uh, there's the program that I just mentioned around planning and zoning. Those are the primary uh, programs that our op office operates. There's a whole ton of other stuff that is uh, that is uh, available through the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, who are our partners on that. They have bigger programs like the low income housing tax credit, more established sort of uh, tools for developers. Uh, they do a lot of multifamily programs and so on. So uh, there is resource that is available. Um, some of that stuff gets pretty complicated and it's uh, really hard like for a smaller developer to get into, which was kind of where we came up with this concept of the Invest in H program to be able to get into those uh, types of developments in addition to the larger ones. As far as uh, minimum wage goes, uh, that ultimately uh, is a decision that rests with our legislature as to how they're going to address that issue. I would say right now, with the sort of data that you see here from uh, from Brian, that we're, we're, we don't have a whole ton of people that are in that category. Uh, we still see rising wages in a lot of areas. Um, but uh, as far as the New Hampshire minimum wage uh, as we know, that still sits at the federal level at about 750 or something. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Caswell and Brian. I appreciate your time and answering our questions. <laughs> I'm sure that there will be more questions uh, when we end today. So I hope you'll stick around for some coffee and, and eat. Please. Um, before we close out, I did want to um, ask Exeter's Economic Development Director, Darren Winham, who's here today, to just share a couple uh, reflections. When you leave today, what are, the, what are you going to be thinking about? And what are the implications for Exeter? Thank you, Darren. All right. I had a whole speech prepared, but... Uh, you guys can clap, too, if you want. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, Exeter is uniquely positioned. Uh, we have to have success. We're like uh, uh, Oscar Wilde. If you, if, if success is a science. If you have the conditions, you get the results. We have a train station. We have um, the, most, uh, the most financially endowed private high school in the world here. We have a uh, vibrant downtown, so we're going to be successful. What I took out of today is how do we get the communities around us to, particip to participate as well? That's what we have to do. We're going to be successful. We want them to be, them to be ses successful. And so we have to work with them. The, the Cedars, like Taylor talked about, we need to put a lot of effort into uh, helping our, our neighboring communities to realize our success. And we have to do that throughout the state. And so that's, uh, that's where I'm focused. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That's all I have. <laughs> I thought you were going to do a mic drop there, Darren, for a second. Uh, thank you, Darren. Thank you again to our speakers, Commissioner Caswell and Brian Gottlob, uh, and for their time, for sharing their expertise, and for the conversation. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, I also want to, again, thank our sponsors, Cambridge Trust and D.F. Richard, for their support of today's program. And all of you uh, for taking the time out to join us this morning. We know that uh, everybody is, is juggling a lot of things, and we're glad that you took the time to spend the morning with us discovering and discussing these important topics. So um, with that, I am going to close with just uh, two quick reminders. One, 
uh, I encourage you to stay and uh, take a tour of SST and the programs here. I guarantee that you will walk away um, with your mind blown, whether you have never been on that tour or if you want a refresher of that tour, please do. And thank you again to our friends at SST for hosting. It was really wonderful. So as a reminder, please uh, stay if you wish. And um, we have tons of breakfast left over. So uh, before you leave, have some more breakfast, fill your coffee. Uh, it's a great way to start the day. So again, thank you all so much for joining us and um, we'll look forward to seeing you soon.